we'll go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll kick it off. So uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to join. Really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Leo Des. I'm a consultant with the Cretech Global Innovation Consulting Practice. I specialize myself in building access uh, in the access control systems and, and as such that are going into buildings. Uh, I'm proud to be serving as the MC for today's webinar. It's called Putting the Pieces Together, a Fully Connected Multifamily Community. Uh, my friends at IOTIS, which is the premier provider of cutting edge integrated smart apartment technology solutions, has helped us put together a great panel uh, for today. Uh, we've got a bunch of leaders in the connectivity side, uh, access control management, and other property technologies. So together, we're gonna explore options available for today's multifamily and mixed use assets and how to pull those pieces together to create optimal experiences for residents and management teams alike. Before we jump into it though, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the Cretech Global Innovation Consulting Practice. Uh, so it's a practice that was built to advise real estate companies and startups on product recommendations, innovation strategies, blitz scaling and outsourced and CIO solutions. Cretech is, I think we all agree, is uniquely positioned to form this kind of a uh, first of its kind consulting consortium based on the massive global reach they have, deep knowledge of the real estate tech ecosystem and access to the most accomplished tech experts in the world. Before we jump into the webinar, one last thing I wanted to talk to you about was some of the events that are coming up this fall um, that Cretech has. So we're gonna start off with a two-part virtual event focused on the timely and important issue of sustainability and real estate. Attendees will hear from the leaders on the forefront of creating healthier, safer buildings and cities throughout the built, entire built world, including corporate professionals, real estate companies, investors, technologies, companies, and governmental leaders. So if you would just go check out uh, www.cretech.com forward slash events for a full list of upcoming events. And to find out more about the Sustainability Summit, uh, that's the great place to go to do that. And now to today's webinar and the reason why you all came. So putting the pieces together, a fully connected multifamily community, I'm excited to pass the mic over to the moderator, Kabir Seth from Presidio Bay. Kabir, it's all yours. Thanks very much, Lee, and thanks to everybody who's joining us virtually for this uh, will hopefully be a pretty illuminating panel, uh, both for develop developers, operators, uh, building owners alike. Uh, so just a quick background on me. So I'm a director of Presidio Bay Ventures. We're a Bay Area-based uh, real estate developer and uh, have a little over a thousand units of multifamily uh, units in our pipeline, uh, and many of them about to begin construction. Um, and so this is a really timely conversation uh, because we do have the luxury of thinking through what our projects uh, ought to look like for the residents of the future. And through the help of folks like Lane, uh, IOTIS, they've been uh, very instrumental in helping me sort of Frankenstein all the different pieces of technology that currently exist today. Um, and I'm joined today by a handful of um, great individuals from across the multi connected multifamily spectrum. We've got Lane Spencer, Director of Sales and Marketing at, at IOTIS, Colin Dupree, who's a business leader at Salter Residential, and Mark Law, who's a Director of Product Management at uh, Boingo Wireless. And so I'm going to start off with a few questions uh, that will be directed first to uh, each of the panelists individually. And then after that, we'll move to a series of questions that will be addressed to the panel at large, where I'm hoping each of you can uh, take turns answering, um, really providing your uh, specific domain expertise and your sort of view of the world as it relates to uh, connected multifamily communities. So Lane, starting off with you, um, you know, from our perspective, obviously it seems like just about everything uh, uh, that, is, that can be online is coming online these days and everything that you want to be connected can be connected. And even for the more sort of progressive multifamily operators, and we would consider Presidio Bay to be among those, uh, it can be pretty overwhelming to figure out even where to start. So for a developer or a multifamily owner and operator thinking about how to build their next smart community, um, whether it's a new development or looking at their uh, assets in their existing portfolio, how do we even start to begin uh, helping others define how they should approach this task? Yeah, that's a terrific, terrific question. And uh, as you know, in our experience uh, working together, we often, as, as the IoT provider who's being looked at, uh, often early in the stages of, of discovery, if you will, for a project, whether it's a new construction project or 
an owner operator is looking at a renovation project or retrofitting a property with smart apartment technology, there's some really important choices they have to navigate, right? Um, they're, they're looking to fill, as you are, and, and we found a, a pretty hefty functionality matrix. You know, and the more the moving parts your property has, the more complicated that functionality matrix is going to be. So, you know, we understand as that IoT provider that every asset and every company's approach is going to be different. We want to provide maximum choice, but we also want to ensure that there's going to be, a, you know, interoperability between those different pieces of functionality that you're looking to deliver. Um, so what we try to do um, as a provider in this space is, is to look at our relationship with owners and operators from a very consultative perspective. You know, we want to walk through what are your operational goals as, as a company? How do you operate? What are your business objectives for that property? And then what kind of resident experience are you looking to deliver? And what we find in all of these conversations is there, there are kind of four overarching um, key areas that we, that we kind of need to talk through and, and help uh, our clients navigate. Um, four pillars, if you will. It, it really, as you can imagine, you were mentioning the connectivity piece. It all starts with what kind of connectivity infrastructure are we looking at here? Uh, that's where folks like our partners at Boingo and uh, other ISPs, you know, what, what is the service delivery model for the property? And how are we get, gonna connect all of these different systems? Uh, so we wanna make sure that that's thought through, uh, whether the project is a new construction that's going up and we've got plenty of lead time or whether it's something we wanna stand up pretty quickly. So that connectivity piece, absolutely key. So we want to navigate that. The second pillar is the IoT piece. So you know exactly what is the value prop from the operational side that, that we want to deliver, uh, and then what kind of again experience do you want to deliver that resident? So that's looking at the hardware that might be brought into the puzzle, uh, and what to outfit units with. Then we get into access control, and that is a very complicated side of things. What does that ecosystem look like at the property? You know, from the main entrances to the elevators to secondary access points to the unit itself, how do we handle residents and guests? Uh, and then the fourth pillar and a super key one is operational solutions that the partner is looking at, uh, you know, from their PMS and accounting platform to what resident portal they're utilizing. You know, we want to reduce double entry, cut down on redundancies and provide a seamless as possible an experience. So those are the four key areas we tend to talk through. Connectivity, IoT, access control, and then operations platforms. Um, I think if we can pull those things together, uh, we can put together something that's uh, uh, that's going to deliver on all fronts. Yeah, that's uh, you know, when in on some of the discussions that you and I have had, that's a really uh, I would say a very good place to start. I mean, there's obviously so much innovation that's taking place across the spectrum that has been taking place, right? Whether it's connectivity, whether it's access control, whether it's IoT. Um, it's obviously impossible for one company to really do all this. And again, kind of sitting at the building, sitting at the center for owners and operators of multifamily assets like ourselves, this kind of, you know, heuristic or playbook is really what I've been looking for. I know that other people and other, my other colleagues and other uh, and the companies in, in our role, they're really looking uh, to put together because it's really difficult to figure out which one to prioritize. And there really isn't one, specific domain that does take a priority because it all has to fit together, particularly in the multifamily community, because you have to serve both the residents and you have to serve the asset um, and everybody else interacts with the community. It's a very unique and different use case um, than perhaps more focused forms of, of real estate like industrial uses, which have their own challenges, but obviously the multifamily, there's just, you know, a, a sort of a plethora of users and use cases that need to be uh, to be considered. And so I think this these four pillars that you've laid out are, are a really great, great place to start. Um, and so touching on that, and I'll throw in a question to Mark here at Boingo, obviously one of the one of the pillars that Lane touched on was the connectivity. Um, you know, this can be a new area for many multifamily operators, given the options that exist out there. And there really aren't any developers that I know of that have a VP of data, a VP of information technology, but maybe they ought to in, in this day and age. Uh, so kind of, uh, let's put this question in two parts. Have you seen a shift in the sophistication of multifamily operators uh, with regards to their data needs? Are they coming up to providers with more nuanced questions around bandwidth, around accessibility, around managed services, and so on? Uh, and then secondly, how has the technology that's being provided by folks like Boingo uh, between both the hardware and software evolved uh, to really meet the, the changing demand for data needs within multifamily communities? 
Sure. Uh, thank you, Kabir. Uh, first of all, a very small snippet about Boingo. Uh, you might know us in the airports, uh, but we also have an entire business unit focused on multifamily space, student housing, conventional, uh, serving over 2,200 communities and also 300,000 uh, residences across the United States and the world. Um, so, all right, let's back to your question. So let's take a look at the first part, first part about data and also a little bit about technology. So we've definitely seen the multifamily operators kind of upping the game in terms of understanding of technology as well as data from the technology side, even as nuanced as telecom communications. Uh, they know every, they know uh, a high level how a DAS system works, private LTE, Wi-Fi, and all those high level economics, they understand all that. From data perspective, some of the progressive ones that we have seen recently is they're starting to really invest in their own data lake infrastructure. Because uh, they understand that subsystems, even as the internet service, can often provide value valuable data. Uh, so one great example I want to share is very simple, actually. A uh, property in Indiana that we serve, uh, we set up not just a resident Wi-Fi, but also the guest network. So the friends and family uh, come, to the, come to the property, uh, they sign on, they provide some information, and they go online. Now, with that data, they were actually able to activate that data target those guests specifically, and actually convert them into real tenants to reduce the lease up time. So that truly turned data into NOI for the property. Now, right now the data for them is offered through the Boingo kind of property portal, but the real progressive ones, one that we're working with right now in DC, uh, we're having some discussions about integrating our data lake and Amazon Web Services uh, to their data infrastructure that they're starting to set up. So that they have one single source of truth that connects all the data together, not just from internet service, but from other subsystems. So that comes to really show that a successful connected community is not just about the seamless technology or the experience on site, on prem, uh, but a strong mm -hmm. data backbone that kind of supports this whole thing. Interesting. And, and so as, uh, again, as, as an owner of and a developer of multifamily assets, you know, one of the questions that I'm sort of asking myself now, and this is why this conversation is timely is, well, how do I differentiate between the various providers of data into the building? I've got my programmatic needs, um, but some could look at that provision of data as almost a, a commodity. So how does Boingo set itself apart from, say, some of the larger incumbents, uh, whether it's the AT&Ts and the Comcast of the world? What is it that a, an operator should really be thinking about when they're selecting a provider um, to bring data into their multifamily community? Sure, makes sense. So right now, um, I would say from a connectivity perspective, uh, everyone's focused on managed Wi-Fi service. It makes sense. It's common denominator technology, all device connects to it. Uh, but that, that is probably not going to be the future. Uh, one day, maybe the property IoT device, uh, the number of devices that you need just kind of explodes. And in that case, you may want to be considering your own private LTE network, uh, auctioning, going to the auctions to get your own CBRS spectrum band. Or maybe one day self-driving car actually becomes true, and now you need an indoor mm -hmm. 5G solution for the low, low latency connectivity. So it's not just about Wi-Fi, but this whole spectrum of technologies. So at Boingo, we kind of focus on that. We sit on the boards of all the telecom technology standard bodies, whether it's Wi-Fi, cellular, or private LTE. We position ourselves as a partner to help them understand the pros and cons, cut through the marketing layer, understand the technology, where it is in the hype cycle, when and how to deploy at the right time. And we focus on also providing a VIP treatment for the property, kind of similar to what Lane has talked about. We understand every single property is different, uh, whether it's integrating with the PMS, opening up our APIs to integrate with the property app uh, to help craft the roadmap of the property. So with the technology leadership uh, and driving the standards in the, comp uh, in, in the industry, uh, with the white glove treatment that we provide. And last but not least, the, another piece is uh, we have no geographical restrictions. We can go anywhere the property wants to go. Even some of the incumbents mm -hmm. may not even have that luxury. Yeah, you, you, you touched on a lot of uh, big layers. You know, you, you talked about, you know, when, whenever self-driving cars do happen, there'll be a need for a, a separate form, a separate spectrum, right? I mean, that's, that's so far beyond the, I think, mindset of a lot of operators. And so today the question is, yeah, you know, some some operators ask themselves, "Do I become my own, you know, ISP? Do I provide Wi-Fi?" But really, that that's just the start of. It seems like it's the start of many more complex conversations around the provision of data, and that that data is used for different use cases throughout the property. You know, today we're talking about the Wi-Fi in units and common areas, but really, you're also talking about the data and we'll 
you know, touch on Colin's area of expertise, but, you know, the data that the access control systems use, which may be slightly different, or the data that, you know, other devices and other, you know, uh, networked uh, systems that exist on the community may use. And that's where Boingo really plays a really critical role in servicing all those use cases. That's right. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of times you build the infrastructure on the Wi-Fi and it's much easier to layer on additional technologies in the future. So it's kind of the beachhead yep. uh, to, to, the, to the Grand Island in the end. It's a good way to think about it. So Colin, um, and you know, definitely want to give you the chance to give you, uh, to talk a little about what you do at Salto, but similar to my question for Mark, you know, for a lot of um, asset managers and, and, and property managers, you could forgive kind of uh, the lay person for thinking, well, you know, a, a lock's a lock, right? And in a multifamily building, we're just talking about more locks, right? You know, I just have more doors to deal with. Um, so apart from, you know, like the basic use case that some people may turn to and say, well, you know, a smart lock, you know, allows me to uh, manage uh, permissions. So when a, a unit turns over, a resident turns over, I don't have to call a locksmith. And great, I may save a couple hundred bucks when you know, it turns over. But Thinking beyond that, what does holistic access control mean to you in other contexts of a multifamily community uh, and how does Salto kind of separate itself from uh, some of the other providers out there? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the first thing is, you know, if you go to, Lee's, or to, to Lane's pillars, um, we're the first one that really has a, a huge hardware aspect into it. Um, and so we, we have the, the task of balancing hardware with with that software integration at, at a little bit of a different level than, than the others. So um, I think the first thing that we have to do is recognize that we need to provide a solution for every opening, right? That's the primary responsibility that we have is to make sure that we can control access to every point that needs to be controlled from a physical standpoint. Then we've got to take that to the ecosystem and we now have to be a really good ecosystem partner. How do we not make sure that IOTIS has the entire responsibility to make sure our lock functions the way that the, manage, the property manager and the end user want it to function. We have to now also play a role in that. So we're, mm -hmm. some of the new age stuff that we're coming at it with from the, the multifamily side is we now have the resident as an end user. And on the locking side for the longest time, we weren't a consumer focused industry. You know, the property managers, the business owners, they drove that conversation. And so now we're being forced to, and forced in a good way, right? <laughs> we're we're, we're yeah. having to uh, start designing our hardware for the resident experience, designing our software and our integration partnerships for the, for the resident experience. Um, so in that sense, it's becoming much more than just a lock because, you know, I've said this before on a couple of my other webinars in the past, nobody would choose which place of business they worked at because of the lock was on, that was on the door. But in a multifamily space, a resident may choose not to live at a place because of the lock that's on the door or the way they interact with that lock. And that's a very real thing as a lock manufacturer that we have to respond to and we have to be aware of. So well, it, yeah, and I, and I sorry to interrupt, but I think that interaction piece is pretty important because in the early stages, we've we've been early adopters and implementers of you know smart access control technology, and one of the things that we noticed early on, and this was really once we also brought IOTIS into the conversation, was the difference between sort of closed systems and open systems. How does where does Salto sit in that? Because that's been uh, a sort of hot topic of discussion. Does it make more sense for a single provider to own, to start off with the unit and then own the building control and, and sort of grow from there? Or is that just kind of, a, uh, in my mind, I don't, you know, I'm being a little biased here. It seems it can make life a little more difficult because you just have to play nice with so many of these different systems. So I'm curious to where Salto sits in the conversation about being sort of an open platform with regards to its hardware and software versus a more of a closed platform. Yeah, I mean, op open's a, a complicated term, I think, right? Uh, is it open source, open system, open platform? What, what all does that mean? Mm -hmm. What we want to do is provide a solution for every door, whether that's the common area door, the entry door, the, the unit door, and then make sure that we're an ecosystem partner, right? And, and we try to use the word ecosystem, I would say, instead of open, um, because there's mm -hmm. certain closed aspects to every solution, right? Of, of proprietary technology and that sort of a thing. Um, but we also recognize the, the need for partners uh, and, and we're not going to win this by ourselves, certainly. Uh, so we want to make sure that we uh, allow 
enough information and as much information as, as reasonable to be shared, right? Because the other way that we're no longer just a lock uh, to piggyback on what Mark was talking about is we're now a data point and not just a data point for operational, but data point for planning. How often did somebody use the gym? How often are people using the pool? What, when we build our next you know, multi-million dollar building, what's needed? And we can now start to provide even additional data points um, in, in providing value that just a lot can't do. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, you know, one of the pillars that isn't represented here, uh, but that Lane touched on really is that, that portal uh, or application, right? Uh, which sort of, I wouldn't say brings everything together, but certainly it's a critical component for whether you are a, a tenant uh, that needs to have some means of uh, accessing uh, or, or activating and interacting with your smart access control, uh, whether it's uh, potentially you know, interacting with uh, connected devices in your unit uh, through IOTIS, uh, or really even you know, managing, and whether we're talking about connectivity, managing your accounting and services. And so I think we're still a ways away from sort of holy grail of, you know, some people have talked about, will there ever be a world where multifamily communities have an iOS or Android sort of operating type system that brings all these together? Uh, and for some that, you know, is, is, is an objective. But I'm curious to get each of your thoughts as to how each of your respective domains uh, interacts with this, this sort of portal or application that, that really brings everything together. Because uh, from a usability standpoint, obviously the thing you want to avoid is just having multiple applications and accounts and, and means that we should do it. And that's kind of what some of these uh, providers aim to do is to integrate uh, with the three of your pillars and to bring it all together in a way that's sort of a unified experience for the residents uh, and the actual property and asset managers themselves. So Lane, perhaps starting with you, I'd love to get your thoughts as, you know, on the, on the operating app side. Um, how does IOTIS think about that and how do you guys uh, typically uh, would partner with them in multifamily communities? Yeah, uh, super question. I mean, you know, what we recognize as as a provider in this space is how very critical, you know, the PMS system as the backbone for the property for their accounting and otherwise, uh, and then the resident portal for interactions with those residents, how critical those two pieces are. And, you know, depending upon the complexity of the property, of course, you know, you might have a, a more uh, straightforward resident portal, you know, a resident portal at a minimum is allowing folks to submit maintenance requests and manage those, make their rent payments, have some communication with their, their management team. So there's that aspect that, uh, you know, in, in larger properties like the ones we've worked on uh, with, with Presidio Bay and, and many others uh, that, ha that really need that robust, uh, really robust feature set, you know, package tracking, reservations, community events, resident resident interactions, a marketplace, special offers, interacting with uh, local businesses, making announcements, and, right. and the list goes on and on and on. We understand that those are areas that, you know, that, that are a part of that matrix that you need. So we look to partner uh, with those providers. Uh, we have built out, uh, in many cases, uh, a, a really deep integration. We have integrations on various levels with those providers. So we have a mobile app SDK, for instance, uh, so that we can really offer up as seamless an experience for the owner operator. We know that they don't want their residents to have to be interacting with three or four different apps. They also don't want their property teams having to manage multiple tools and do double entry. Uh, so we look to, to solve for that. So um, definitely see those providers as key partners uh, of, uh, you know, within this uh, matrix and uh, wanna, wanna offer that up as seamlessly as possible. The other piece of that is we wanna always pr preserve choice for folks like you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have different assets, you might be using, you might have a different preferred resident portal for a different asset. So we want to make that uh, a flexible piece of the puzzle for you. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, kind of the trifecta, I guess, if you will, of try and provide that one-stop shop, like you said, that holy grail. I think we can get close to it when we're, when we're uh, pulling in the access control piece through an integration with a partner like Salto, and then we're uh, kind of plugging into the back end of that resident portal, and then the resident kind of is able to find everything from one source of truth, but really all those systems are in the background, a part of the ecosystem to Colin's point here just a bit ago. Yeah. And then Mark, from, from the Boringer perspective, again, this goes back to what you touched on, which is the sort of the layers of, of managed services. I mean, this is potentially an avenue where these resident portals 
could play a role where, you know, for, for a property manager, it would be basically, a, you know, a desktop application, uh, which is really built in sort of like a, you know, a Boingo backbone, but it allows the property managers to really have a, a really easy to use interface as to how to manage permissions, how to create different owner networks and so on. Is that kind of how you see your interaction with these portals or, uh, or is it more separate or is more out, is Boingo sort of live outside of that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we definitely see it that way. Um, it's all about integration. And also if you look at the industry, there's also a lot more kind of consolidation, you know, even starting with uh, our friends at IOTA as being to integrate all these desperate devices into one single platform. And if an owner wants to integrate that, they get a subsystem of many, many other subsystems within it. So uh, we totally see that. Uh, from, from a telecom kind of internet service provider perspective, we have a portal that um, our resident pro uh, property managers can use to manage access rights and permissions. But most importantly, we do understand that property owner wants to develop that top layer tech stack that sits on top of yep. everyone. And it's getting easier mm -hmm. because there's consolidation. And with that, uh, our goal kind of very similar piggybacking on Colin's note, it, we're about to become a we're all about being a ecosystem partner to a certain extent. Um, right now we're partnering with a partner in DC where we open up all our APIs and they built their own resident portal and they can use mm -hmm. that to, to integrate with our entire system end to end. That's great. And, and just for the audience's perspective, I think it's always helpful to have kind of a tangible, tangible example of how these things are playing out in real life. So what's like a, for that property you just mentioned, what's, what's a use case? Uh, what's a specific example of something they built out that's been helpful to them? Uh, sure. On the property? Uh, yeah. In that example, I mean, we're like white labeling our internet service for them. Um, so it's their branded internet service and uh, rather than us integrating with the PMS, they want to take control and take the destiny in their own hands, build a resident portal, mm -hmm. do all the billing, and based on the billing that they have that ties to the lease, ties to the rent, uh, they can activate the wireless service uh, when they move in and when they move out, deactivate the internet service and do all the billing stuff in the back end. That's great. So it's all from the user's perspective. It's all wrapped into one into their rent package and or they may be able to, I don't know if it's possible right now, but for individual residents, perhaps upgrade or downgrade the service. Maybe that's something down the line, but essentially that's kind of the world that this, this community is living in where a resident could come in and essentially the moment they walk through the door, their wireless internet set up in addition to maybe other services because it's being managed by the, the asset operator. Yes, absolutely. And through that app that building, they also had an upgrade and downgrade flow for different kinds of internet tier packages too. That's great. That's great. Um, and so Colin, um, over to you on, on the same question. Um, how do you see, and this is, you kind of touched on it earlier with regards to the APIs, but uh, how, how do you see your uh, Salto's uh, role and in, um, in interaction with the resident portal and the, and the PMS systems that the other two have been discussing? I mean, it's, it's similar to that, that same ecosystem conversation, right? And, and we're, we're not going to do it alone. But with that, we also have to be innovating ourselves, right? And, and when the resident or the property manager identifies a need or a demand or a new use case, um, we, have, we have to start internally and say, hey, is this a feature we can provide? Or is this a feature we need to align with somebody to provide, right? Because the, the other piece with an ecosystem that you don't want to get into is, 75 different players and then one integrator trying to bring all of that together at the same point that becomes challenging and, and over complicates the, the ecosystem as well. Um, so I think when these new demands and these these requests come in, it's really important to first establish hey, is this a feature that we have the skill set and the capability to provide um, and that we can build and add or do we do we need to go somewhere else. Um, you know, the, just kind of our overall approach to it is uh, we can no longer just be a hardware provider, right? We have to provide mm -hmm. that, that next level. But at the same point, we have to be a great hardware provider. Um, and so, yep. so we recognize the need to continue to improve and innovate our hardware sets um, while also continuing to improve our software sets for both feature and, and use cases, as well as that ecosystem interoperability and connectivity and things of that nature. Um, because we certainly understand the, the demand for one, one interaction point for property owners and managers and residents. Um, and, and so we recognize that, but we also can't just say, 
hey, this is what we do. We're going to do this and this is all we're going to do. No, we have to innovate our, uh, as well uh, on our side um, so that hopefully we don't have to bring in somebody new every single time and just further complicate that, that potential ecosystem. Yep, definitely. And um, so my next topic is going to be in something that, uh, you know, a lot of people are concerned about, but I don't think we spend enough time talking about, which is privacy. But before we do that, you know, we did get a question from the audience. I think it's actually worth uh, explaining the, uh, this one because I, I have a feeling we're going to use this acronym a couple of times. Uh, the question from the audience was, what is an API? So I don't know who wants to answer this question, but if anybody has the expertise, would love a quick uh, layman's definition of what an API is and, and what it, and how it really relates to you know some of the stuff we're talking about. So I don't know if Mark, Colin, or Lane, whoever wants to give it a go. Uh, I can try. Um, so API is basically the agreement between two computer systems how they can communicate to each other. So computers versus humans. So let's take an analogy in, uh, on the human side. If you want to go to a coffee shop and you want to order a coffee, you can't just say, give me a coffee, right? There are specific things that you need to say in order to get a coffee. For example, I want a grande latte, 290 degrees with foam, right? Those are the parameters you need in order to get a coffee. So API is basically kind of that agreement between two systems whether a system from IOTIS, from Boingo, or PMS system, how they talk to each other. That's what the API is. Really. No, thank you for that, Mark. I think that's actually really helpful. And, and, I, and I felt the need, I think, to answer that question before we dive into the things like privacy, because really that's really what one of the, I imagine the functionalities that the APIs exist for is to control and preserve privacy across these platforms because you have all these disparate systems really talking to each other. Uh, and so it's, a, it's hugely important that for us, for example, as a developer, all of our partners take privacy as seriously as we do. Um, the last thing we want, especially in the world we live in, uh, given that, uh, you know, the platonic ideal of a connected community is one where everything that could possibly exist across this chain of products and devices can be connected. And a reasonable person is going to ask, well, an attendant, I should say, in, the, in this context, well, what about my privacy? Uh, what is it that you know about me? What is it these systems are sharing about me? Uh, and I realize that privacy may mean different things to each of you, given your respective domains. Uh, but I'm curious to get your take whether, um, you know, whether it's IOTIS's uh, um, sort of device management within the unit, uh, Salter's in regards to access control, and there's concerns around, uh, you know, hacking of, of, of entry systems. That's, that's obviously uh, a, a, a real concern for both operators and residents alike. Uh, or even, for example, from Boyer's perspective, where you have these layers of networks how does it? How do how do we think about privacy? And so I'll I'll take these. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll get answers from each of you in reverse from last time. So maybe I'll start with Colin. Um, how do you? How does Salto think about privacy um, with regards to its access control systems? Uh, I mean, number one, right? Uh, from from our core, we are we are a life safety uh, industry uh, to to begin with, right? Access into into residents into buildings, uh, se security is at our core. So. Um, obviously, as we get into, you know, mobile credentials and, and wireless networks and all of that, uh, the, the, the physical side of it, our goal is certainly to be secure and encrypted from credential to database, whether that's a database in the cloud, wherever that resides, right? We want to be responsible to ensure that that access granted decision is secure from credential to, to decision maker, wherever that is. But beyond that, we, we now are into cybersecurity and data security and, and that sort of a thing, especially as we start to open APIs and, and we now start, you know, I, I said it earlier, we want measure residents' use of gyms and things of that nature. Well, hold on, you know, are we going to know which resident or just the quantities of reg residents and right. control what data is shared? And, and um, so we have to be flexible in that because owners and operators and residents alike are going to want and have different demands of how that data gets shared. And so uh, we do, we, we take it very serious as it relates to uh, what is usable and, and helpful data and what is privacy data and how do you protect that? And, and so we, we have to walk the fine line there, but um, certainly from our core of an access security piece, we carry that same level of importance to our data and to our cyber. And, and as we get into this ecosystem, we take that to our partners and we want our partners to be as invested in the security of their data and their communication 
um, as, as we are. So uh, to us, it is, a, it is a very, very high priority uh, to the point where, you know, we are pretty hard and fast on how we allow people to get access into stuff and one-time passwords for remote access and things of that nature, um, where we, we can maybe, we, we're trying to do our best to put uh, ease of use and convenience with security, but there still are times where security wins out, but we're trying to make that a yep. much better blend than, than what it was in the past. Well, security and especially in today's COVID-19 environment safety, right? I mean, one of the things that is uh, just first and foremost in our minds, for example, whether it's multifamily or even commercial, is it's, it's density control, right? I think from a resident's perspective, it would be great to know that if I'm in a, in a multifamily community where uh, perhaps there's amenities like a gym that I'm paying for and like to use, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, I would love to be able to be able to tell at what times is that gym being used, when is it most what is it most frequently used so maybe I can you know adjust my workout times around that and that's a service and an amenity that I would truly appreciate for my my community but at the same time you mentioned well are they going to know it's me coming in or is it just like a number of people and so I think you know it's funny as you were talking I was like are we going to have to now come up with you know terms of service for residents for our communities now the same way you have terms of services for you know and you know any other piece of technology and, and it may, may be the case right uh, there's always going to be a trade-off I think between benefits of this um, increased connectivity can bring uh, to the trade-offs first and foremost will live within this realm of privacy. Uh, so Mark, so over to you. Um, love to get your thoughts on, on the privacy aspect. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on two things. So privacy, uh, one thing from a telecom network perspective, uh, even if you have one common use infrastructure for all the resident IoT, doesn't mean that the resident loses the privacy. Like the network that we provide for a multifamily building is very different from a network that we put in a public space such as airports. There are tried and true technologies uh, that isolates the traffic to make sure that residents preserve their privacy within even on the same piece of wire that all the data goes through. Um, from a, another piece about security kind of adding on to what Colin was talking about that we often overlook is, is not just really about the technology but it's also about the people in the company, your partner who is handling that data. Do they, are, are all the people trained on how to use the data? Because even if the data is secure, but the personnel handling the data is not trained, I mean, that kind of defeats the purpose. That you might get some leaks, you might get some hacks coming in. And uh, we have a long history of working with the Department of Defense, providing services for the military bases. Uh, we've learned a couple of things uh, throughout the years, sometimes the hard way, sometimes the good way. That's interesting. And Lane? love to get your thoughts, at least, uh, you know, given that IOTIS uh, really prides itself and does a great job of fleet management of, you know, in connected devices within units. What does privacy mean to IOTIS? Um, and how does, you know, how does a multifamily operator like myself answer the question, you know, what's being tracked? What do you, what do you know <laughs> about yeah. my behavior? What don't you yeah. know, right? Absolutely. And one of the most key things, you know, as an IOT provider, we're, we're inside people's homes, right? Um, so it's privacy and security are central to our mission. You know, we've made it our responsibility and our commitment from the beginning uh, to only use what we learn from, you know, from our, our users uh, interaction with our system to continue to improve their lives, to empower them with their own data, um, to make certain that their privacy is respected on every front. Uh, so, you know, any uh, data around smart device controls or, or personal interactions are hidden and inaccessible to any property staff, et cetera. Uh, we have made a commitment not to sell user information. Uh, so extremely key. When it comes to data insights, of course, an IoT platform is, is a pretty powerful tool, right? So any um, data insights that are provided to property staff, which are key uh, for operational efficiencies, et cetera, are anonymized aggregated data that can be useful from, a, mm -hmm. from an operational perspective in the interest of helping those owners and operators deliver just top-notch service and continue to improve the resident experience. So, uh, you know, along those lines, there's that level of commitment for resident privacy. And then, you know, the other side of it, I think that you talk about with system security, and it's really looking at how do we build our tech stack and how do we put together this, uh, this system architecture in a way that yep. does help to protect it from uh, you know, hacking issues, et cetera. So that, you know, that kind of all boils down to which, which protocols do we utilize with our IoT devices? And then how do we build uh, our system uh, in, in terms of how data moves around, um, you know, through our hub up to the cloud, et cetera. So we're very sensitive to keeping that secure as well. 
Uh, so yeah, pretty important stuff. Actually, the most important stuff I think all of us on the panel today deal with is that data side of things and privacy and security. Yeah, and, and, I, and I wonder, you know, you see these standards being developed across other industries like HIPAA for the medical world. You know, I just, I do wonder just as time goes on, will there be a standard developed for, you know, human communities, like residential communities, and I, you know, could very well be the case, just, just given the amount of data that we're just all going to be producing on a, on a second by second basis um, as, as technology continues to evolve. Um, that was great. Thank you for that. I think, I think the privacy piece is definitely something when we think about the playbook is, you know, we don't need to be experts on it as a, from a developer's perspective, but I certainly do want to have a good understanding because at the, at the end of the day, it's my responsibility to manage the relationship with the tenants. And it's not enough for me to look around my partners and say, well, it's their problem or, you know, they're, you know, they're the ones responsible for making your data secure. No, ultimately it's me. I mean, I'm the one bringing together all these partners in. And I need to make sure, as I mentioned, that sort of our values are also collectively aligned and we have a good understanding of how the privacy flows exist between all these different partners. Um, so switching gears now, um, I want to talk about something that's, you know, it's, it's unique. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's not a really a conversation that I have to consider much of because a lot of the product that we deliver is new. Um, but I'm sure that a lot of folks who are listening in uh, who aren't developing new product, but instead own and operate existing multifamily product that may have been built within the last, anywhere between the last five to 50 years. Uh, so with new products, you obviously have the ability to take the time, obviously budget and time with uh, permitting uh, to design the optimal system. Um, and with older product, uh, there may be some physical limitations to bringing these communities online and, and getting them connected in the way that we're, we're talking about. So how do each of you think about um, whether it's your sales approach or it's your recommendation or communication with operators of older vintage communities and what would be your advice to them? Where would you kind of start? Um, or are they just, you know, specific considerations that they need to take in mind? Um, so, you know, last time we started with Colin, so maybe Lane will start with you this time. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, this is, this is a, a, a big, um, big thing that comes up for us and you know about 50 percent of the folks that we talk to are looking at retrofitting a property or they're in the middle of a renovation project and they want to bring in a, a, an exciting new value add um and to your point earlier you know the connectivity piece a lot of times hasn't been thought through um as have not maybe a lot of the other pieces of the puzzle hey we want to make this property property smart what does it take to do that so we really go back to that consultative mode that we talked about earlier uh in the cases of these properties we really want to examine the motives of, of why we want to roll out this, this particular technology. What are the goals, the business goals? What are the residential experience goals? What are they looking for from the operational side to make sure they deliver? And then we get back into navigating those waters and helping them make the right choices. We also, in these cases of a retrofit or an existing property, we have to look at what's already there, what's already on, you know, on site, what wiring exists, what access control points might already exist or systems might already be in place. Um, and, you know, we want to get on site whenever possible. Obviously, during COVID, that's become more challenging than ever. So we a lot of times lean on partners to be able to do that. We want to look at, at feasibility of rolling out different aspects of the IoT platform, the connectivity infrastructure, et cetera. So that's where, again, we bring in partners, partners like our friends at Boingo, partners like our friends at Salto. And we're looking for partners across all disciplines who kind of have the same uh, approach that we do, flexibility you know, approaching this project and saying, what are the unique needs of this project and how can we stand up a system that's going to be reliable, that's going to be cost effective, and it's going to be, it's going to be feasible, right, in this instance. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the other side of it that we get into, though, uh, we have to be, we have to determine all of that, but then along with the client, you've got nuances that exist in, in an, a property that, that's already in place, maybe even fully occupied. So we have to really help them through um, a deployment plan. You know, how do we keep the disruption to residents at a minimum? How do we make it feel not like an inconvenience to the property staff? How do we not have the owner feel like, oh my gosh, this project is insurmountable? We wanna take the pain out of it and we wanna make it easy. Because we've done it time and time again, we wanna help them manage it. We wanna get buy-in from all those multiple stakeholders uh, that need to uh, be engaged and then try to create a seamless rollout across the, uh, across the board. So, you know, from training the on-site staff to mm -hmm. rolling it out to residents, uh, co-marketing support, et cetera, um, all key, but, but just the timing of how we roll out, extremely important. Definitely. 
And so, Mark, when we think about the connectivity piece of it, you know, one of the things, um, you know, this is a real-time conversation I'm having now in one of our projects, which is making sure we have enough uh, cabling coming in from the telco data closets into our units. And again, I have the luxury of being able to manage around that with new construction, but for some of the older projects and, and existing vintage communities, uh, you know, they may not have the luxury of doing it. They may not have the infrastructure that, um, you know, would allow for some of these hard connections. So, uh, do you have a sense of how Boingo is helping, you know, older uh, buildings and older communities uh, work around some of these physical limitations, uh, trying to, you know, get them as well, uh, get them the sort of best-in-class data connectivity so that they can start taking advantage of uh, all the solutions we've been talking about today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, out of kind of all our friends over here, for a connectivity standpoint, if the infrastructure is not there, you talk about opening up all the right. walls and, like, digging up conduit. Yeah. So it's tough. Uh, and I mean, I'll give really more specific so, so everyone can, can help understand. So, for example, properties built before 2005, uh, the cable kind of um, technology wasn't there. I mean, with that cable, for example, you cannot offer more than, let's say, 100 megabits per second for speeds for yep. residents. Right. So, so, I mean, that's kind of the base package nowadays with Internet service providers. So in every retrofit scenario, we make sure we go to do a very detailed site survey to analyze the existing infrastructure. What kind of cable is there? What kind of switching core network infrastructure is there? And give the developer a realistic options on what they can do. If they want to rip and replace the whole thing um, to serve the future, um, we certainly recommend that because connectivity is so key. If you want all these connected IoT devices, they need to be always on, right? You can't just rely on a, uh, a traditional kind of cable uh, provider model where they may not have your, uh, your best interest in mind. Like we put a property in the number one priority in, as far as interest is concerned. But uh, that said, with that old cable, 100 megabits per second, uh, that might be okay for certain demographics of users uh, that you may have or certain applications, IoT device, for example, they don't use that much bandwidth. They just have a lot of device chats a lot, right? So that's pretty much it, not a big deal. Uh, but to provide the resident Wi-Fi service, uh, 100 megabits per second, for example, may not be may not be good enough. And is there a way, you know, one of the, maybe the, again, coming from a non-technical background, one of the questions maybe somebody may have is, is there a way around the physical limitations? Are there wireless options or dish options available that we can uh, work around them? Or is, is that you know, maybe not the right way to think about it um, for some of these older building owners? Yeah, there are definitely certain wireless um, potential capabilities. Uh, but in, in that case, you'll be building, because wireless, you need line of sight. That means you have to see the thing. Mm -hmm. So now you're adding these little mushrooms around your building. Uh, which you may not like. So that's the downside, but yep. certainly you can save some cabling. Mm -hmm. Great. And so Colin, um, your thoughts on, you know, how you think about sort of older, uh, older vintage buildings versus uh, newer, newer developments. Yeah. It, it becomes even more complicated. I think for, for us, when you go from a new building to a, a retrofit for a couple of reasons, obviously the hardware aspect, you know, what's the shape of the door? If the door has been hanging there for 25 years, is it even plain? Is it, is it leveled off? Um, and then security and fire ratings and ADA compliance, you know, can we still put the same type of door lock in that was in uh, mm -hmm. so from a sales perspective, you know, our mindset isn't, isn't um, different but the demand for design and pre-sales engineering and, and that sort of a thing is, is far greater on the retrofit side of things. Ultimately, our goal uh, is to be, be able to deliver the same functionality and the, the same resident experience as a new build, but we may have to do that with different hardware types, right? Which could maybe mean it will cost a little bit more uh, it may mean that it's just not as cool and sexy as what you could put into a new build. Um, yep. But but our goal would be to deliver that same functionality and that same available feature set. Um, but but the hardware limitation may be greater in a in a retrofit style like that. Um, mm -hmm. and one of the questions. I'm just going to take a moment, if if that's okay, to to speak to one of the questions that's out there about 
uh, affordable housing because I think that kind of ties into this same retrofit, right? We don't, we're not going into a multi-million dollar sky rise type of a thing, but the demand is there for connectivity and how do we handle that? You know, from our side, um, we want it, we want to make affordable hardware, right? Uh, so again, mm -hmm. it comes down to uh, how, how do we keep improving that demand? Because the, the, whoever asked that question is absolutely right. It's not, th this, this demand is no longer just in A and A plus developments. I mean, um, it, it, we, we have to be able to deliver that solution everywhere uh, so that we don't continue to separate and, and, and further divide uh, those feature sets from class C to class A plus. So uh, we are certainly working uh, every day to figure out how, how can we deliver a hardware set um, that is feasible in those, in those situations so that we can deliver uh, the necessary resident experience to everybody, not just to class A developments. Definitely, yeah. I mean, that, that that's a really good point about just accessibility and, and equality. I think it's obviously it has to start somewhere, but I think the, everyone's goal is that over time, the same safety and security that we can expect from the systems, just taking salt as an example, is is really what we can expect everywhere, right? That's just that's just basic peace of mind that any developer, whether you're a market rate or affordable housing, would love to um, would love to offer. And so, you know, with the with the remaining ten minutes that we have, there's a couple of <laughs> Really, it's again, I think a great question that are worth answering. Um, the one that came in was for for a multifamily landlord that has no in-house tech support, which is, I'm just going to say, is 99.9% .9 of <laughs> multifamily landlords, including Presidio Bay, despite our, the size of our portfolio. Um, you're looking at it. I'm the tech support <laughs> when it comes to uh, our connected communities. Uh, how challenging is it to onboard some of the solutions that are being discussed? Um, and... I, want, I think what I'd like to uh, learn from each of you is really how each of you support somebody like me uh, in these efforts. Because I think from my perspective, look, without the luxury of having, like I mentioned or joked about before, a VP of technology, right, who's doing this, it's really the, the owners or the development managers who have to take the reins and understand what this ecosystem looks like, understand what are the pillars. And that's why we, that's why we talked about these sort of four main pillars. Um, and so, you know, you are going to have to be at this time of, uh, you know, where we are in the, in the industry, you are going to be after your own quarterback, but that doesn't mean you have to do it alone, right? And that comes with picking the right partners. So uh, with each of you, I'd love to learn how IOTA, Salto, and Boingo, how each of you support folks like us in, in, in these initiatives. You can take just a minute or two to talk about that. So starting maybe with, uh, with Colin, um, you know, what is Salto's involvement um, from day one through integration? Yeah, we, we approach that in, in two ways, I would say, to try to make this as easy as possible on, on folks like yourself. Uh, one is through our partners. We want to make sure that we have partners, boots on the ground, understand our system inside and out, have been involved in the conversations with your team, understand your needs and how we can deliver them. Uh, and then second to that is partnerships with folks at IOTIS so that we can make sure there's an operations manual that everybody understands. Hey, when, when these two things come together, we've done this before. We know how this works and kind of put you, uh, give you that peace of mind that says, okay, I've, I've found the right partners because they are talking, right? The last thing that you should want to do is you become the point person for this partnership, right? You have to make mm -hmm. sure, you know, Lane and I have a good relationship. Mark and I have a relationship on exactly. that we're bringing yep. together. They're working together for your effort versus you bringing them all together. Definitely. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry about that. No, no, go for it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no, for, from our perspective, um, you know, standing up IoT, installing smart devices in units, uh, pulling in the connectivity, interfacing with all the other systems, um, you know, when we're balancing hardware and software, it's a, it's a pretty complicated thing to stand up. And we know that that can be daunting for an owner operator. So what we look to do is take the pain out of it. We have an operations team and dedicated team of what we call our project success managers. So after a project is brought on board, that team goes to work interfacing. It's very much a our team, your team, sort of a partnership. We lay out our statement of work. Uh, after we've gone through that whole articulation of the project and consulted, made sure that we have something that's going to work, then beginning with installation, uh, like Colin said, through partners with boots on the ground, getting that installation into place, 
making sure that hardware is delivered on time per the construction schedule of the project. Then when we get to the point where everything's installed, we've got to get on site and go through a pairing process. We have our technicians who, who take care of that. Uh, then we want to get the community involved. So that's the management team. We want to get them trained and excited. And then we want to help roll out to the residents and get them engaged. So every step of the way, it's a partnership. Um, and we look to simplify that process for our partners so that it doesn't feel like a, like a project. It's more an exciting thing to do. And we've got this. But our partners are absolutely key. Uh, connectivity partners, yep. access control partners, and beyond. Great. Mark, yeah, so, and then we sure. have one last question I'd like to get through before we try and uh, wrap this up. But Mark, please go ahead about the Sounds good. relationship between you and the... Mm -hmm. I'll do this quick. Yeah, so uh, we mm -hmm. take a similar approach as uh, laying for IOTIS, Stop, start to finish from education about telecom to design to project management to install. But most importantly, after the install, from a support perspective, part of our services is providing you a 24-7, 365 network operation center to monitor the network, as well as the 24-7 customer care support specific to your property. You will have your own telephone number and calls in your own, potentially your own greetings on, uh, on, on the tech support side uh, and tech support that are trained on specific applications for your property. So nothing to worry about when working with Boingo, really. Uh, perfect. And then the few minutes we have is one last question. And this was actually asked specifically for access control, but I'm going to uh, try and make this, give everyone one last uh, crack from their own domain. What is, I'll start with access control to Colin. Colin, what is the most uh, common mistake that you see um, with multifamily landlords, at least, when it comes to access control? Oh, uh, that's a hard one. Um, I, I would say a, a couple of the, the mistakes are, um, thinking of the unit and the common area doors as one path, right? You, let's not mm -hmm. solve one solution and not the other because the resident is going to expect that whole, that whole path. Um, and then I think uh, the other one is after install, you know, what Mark just touched on it. How easy is this going to be to adjust and to adapt to something that we maybe didn't think of uh, both from mm -hmm. actual use case at the door, but also management of, providing new access, updating access, changing access, that sort of stuff. Mark, on the connectivity side, what's uh, maybe a mistake that you, uh, you see multifamily landlords make and, and hope they would uh, you know, think about the next time they, they think about upgrading their connectivity system? Um, and for us, it's all about uh, properties, um, maybe uh, not taking the jump to kind of take control of their own destiny on, on taking over the internet service with a pro provider. So if, if you go two routes, if you go with a traditional incumbent, uh, they manage everything. What you also don't get is you lose all the data, right? So that ability to grab the data yep. to target future residences, you don't have that anymore. With internet service, yep. you can do that. And now you have an internet service that not only is for the residents to increase your rent premium, but also connects all your IoT devices. So it's really looking at this asset that kills multiple birds with one stone that really extract too much value out of it. So, I mean, that's kind of the long-term thinking we're hoping to get our partners to kind of start thinking about. That's great insight. And Lane, on the IoT side? Uh, for, from our perspective, I think it's just um, not having conversations early enough and not pulling in all stakeholders early enough. So, you know, your asset managers, your development and construction teams, your integrators, making sure that everybody is firing on the same cylinders, I think is so key and being able to pull together you know, such a complicated infrastructure. So I think, uh, you know, having those conversations early and bringing in all the right folks um, is, is absolutely key. That's a mistake that I see made. Uh, somebody leaves out a, a critical piece of that and then um, yeah. we're having to kind of fix it after the fact. Awesome. Well, everyone, I think this has been uh, hopefully a very valuable and educational conversation for everybody listening in. I'm going to turn this back over to Lee uh, to wrap this up. I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to register and, and listen in. And um, I mean, Lee can follow up with next steps on how to get in touch with us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, could be a great job. You landed this plane right on time too, which is uh, not easy <laughs> to do. So uh, great job on that end. And thanks everyone. As Kabir said, thanks for joining. Uh, if you want, check out uh, IOTIS, Cretech, go to IOTIS, uh, uh, I'm sorry, www.iotishome.com to check out them more. And I really appreciate everyone on the panel and everyone for participating. Thank you. Great conversation, ton of great information and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.